Hello everyone, and welcome to AISC's live webinar series, Introduction to Steel Bridge Design. Today is October 12, 2017, and this is Session L1, Steel Bridge Fabrication, presented today by Carl Frank. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker, Carl H. Frank, Ph.D. Dr. Carl Frank recently retired as Chief Engineer at Hirschfeld Industries. He is currently a consultant to Hirschfeld, NSBA, and others in steel bridge design and fabrication. Prior to joining Hirschfeld, he was a member of the Structural Engineering Faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. His research work has included the fatigue and fracture behavior of welded and bolted connections, fatigue behavior of cable stays, strength of composite girders, and fracture behavior of twin box girder structures. He has participated in the virtual assembly effort underway at Hirschfeld, as well as the impl implementation of new welding and inspection technology. Dr. Frank, thanks for being here, and I'll hand things over for you. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon from Austin, Texas. Uh, this is going to be a, a discussion and uh, to show you how uh, typically uh, steel girder bridges are fabricated. So we're going to talk about um, a little bit about uh, the issues dealing from a design standpoint and hopefully uh, give you some insight that will help you for your designs. We'll be mainly talking about plate girders and plate girder design. We'll talk about how we build the bridge and how we do it now and how we're, we're, the things that are going on for the future. This is a typical plate girder bridge being erected. Uh, the thing to understand, and I'm sure you're aware of that, basically uh, girder bridges and, and any steel bridge is a modular design. Uh, we fabricate it in the shop, the modules go out to the field, and all that's really required mostly in the field is just a, a wrench and some bolts to put the pieces together. Uh, obviously, there's cranes involved and, and shoring towers, but it is uh, a custom-built element that uh, we, we uh, put together in the shop and make sure that it fits so it can go uh, be erected quickly in the field. Uh, the completed structure, we end up with these plate girder bridges. And if you look at a plate girder, it's uh, three plates. It's two flanges plus a web plus some auxiliary members, uh, stiffeners, and things like this. But it ends up with a nice, clean-looking structure. It could be like this, a, a plate girder, or it could be what we call a tub girder. In every case, the girders are typically composite. That is, uh, the top flange is composite with a steel deck. The object and the design of these bridges, we end up with a very strong and ductile structure. This is an indication of a, a very heavy permit load going across. If you look carefully on the bridge right here at this level, you can see the deflection in the deck. And this is an elastic deflection, and the bridge rebounds after this. So we have uh, the goal is to uh, fabricate and 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 give produce a ductile, a strong structure. Now the the difficulty with if you wish with plate girder design versus if you've been in an undergraduate course where let's say you talked about build building design. Uh, what you do in a building design, you have the moment requirement, and you go into a table, and it gives you uh, a selection of beams that will meet that requirement, roll beams. And typically in a longer span steel bridge, we're going to use a plate girder. And so you start with a clean sheet of paper. You get, you're able to develop a custom design section, uh, typically deeper and a thinner webs than a roll beam. They'll be lighter. The deeper sections produce stronger and stiffer bridges. And then you get a choice of steel strengths. Um, you can mix and match the steel strengths to put the strength where you need it. And also, typically, they're not composite. I mean, they're, they're not symmetric, excuse me. They're a composite design. And so we'll use a smaller top flange and a bottom flange, particularly in the negative moment region, because we're making use of the concrete deck as part of a structural element. Um, if you look at the um, limit states that, that go into controlling in the top flange in the positive moment region, it will be controlled by lateral torsional buckling uh, uh, during construction and yielding or local buckling of the flange uh, later on. 
the web is controlled typically by shear at the pier and, uh, and then web bend buckling. And the important thing to note when we're looking at the web is that we've introduced this form, uh, term D sub C, which is the depth of the web and compression. Since these are unsymmetrical sections, uh, they'll be typically in the positive moment region more than half the web depth in compression. And the, the bottom flange in the positive moment region is basically controlled by yielding uh, during uh, completed structure. We look at a starting point of how do we start out on this uh, design of a plate girder. Uh, typically, we're looking at span to depth ratios of 25 to 30. And so if we know the span, uh, we can get a starting point for the depth of the girder. Uh, the typical girder cross sections uh, look like the one on the right, where we have a smaller top flange than the bottom. And that produces the depth of the web and compression that's greater than uh, half the web depth. Uh, typically, we limit the, um, the web slenderness to around 120. Uh, if you go to a very slender web, you'll have to add longitudinal stiffeners to prevent bend buckling. And usually, that's not the most efficient girders unless you have an extremely long span. Um, we want to hold the, the depth of the web and compression. Uh, if we hold it less than 137, then we don't need those longitudinal stiffeners. The typical proportions of the girder, and, and if we're looking at the compression flange, is typically uh, somewhere equal to like one quarter of the depth or one sixth the depth. Um, and we also want to control the flange slenderness. If we go to a very slender uh, flange slenderness, you'll be controlled by local buckling of the flange. Uh, it'll, give you a local buckling stress below the yield. If you have a grade 50 material, if you keep the flange slenderness below 9.2, uh, you're limited only by the yield strength. Typically, the top flange is about two-thirds the area of the bottom flange. Uh, that's a typical starting point for these girders. Transverse stiffeners, uh, the vertical stiffeners here shown here, are added to the, uh, the girder to increase uh, the shear capacity. This is actually Justin Nocell from Federal Highway standing uh, in, in uh, to show you the depth of that girder. We can build, uh, this shows, a, this is a long span uh, plate girder. Uh, this is actually uses a substringer system uh, between the, the girders to carry the load, but this is a 300 foot long uh, span to 350 foot span uh, plate girder. So we take, if we just want to just get an, uh, an idea of what we're looking at, if we have a 200 foot span, uh, if we want to stay at uh, a depth to span ratio of 25, that gives us an eight foot deep girder. If we want to meet the web slenderness limit of 120, a seven eighth inch flange gives us 110. So We've got now a, a web depth and we've got a web thickness. And if we look at the flange, compression flange, well, we want it to be about uh, one quarter of the, um, the depth. So that gives us two foot wide or 24 inches. And to meet the um, B over T requirement of 9.2, if we use an inch and three eighths flange, it gives us a slenderness of 8.7. So these are be a starting point that you could use on this girder. Uh, one thing I just want to point out to you, these are the, this is out of the ASHTO specifications, and they give you these limits. And um, I know, uh, and being taught this in, in a classroom situation, some students look at it and say, well, these must be the optimum limits. I want to go to these limits. Actually, these limits actually come as limits of the analysis of girders and tests of girders that were done to produce the specification. In other words, they're the box you should stay within, not that then you shouldn't necessarily stay at these limits. So if you if you look at the flange slenderness, remember we want to go probably 9.2 rather than 12 for uh, compression flanges. Um, D over six is a pretty slender flange. 
Uh, it almost looks like an eye girder, and it might be uh, better to stick closer to D over 4. Um, the flange should be thicker than the web. Uh, typically, it's one and a half to two times the thickness. This would be a very slender one. The bottom one, the last one, is important because what it's telling you is we don't want to end up with sections that look like eye sections with a very large bottom flange and a very small top flange. This, this comes about when you're considering it as a, um, a composite girder that you actually the composite neutral axis can be very close to the top flange and you end up saying, well, I don't need much there. If, you're, um, if you go to that limit, you end up with something that looks like a T section and, uh, and the equations we have for lateral torsional buckling don't really apply. So this is important to keep this uh, this limit. This is just the ratio of the compression of uh, the lateral stiffness of the compression to the tension flange. Now here's a girder that it was actually built. Um, there's a little story behind this. Um, when when our estimator was estimating this job, he, the, the dimension thickness of the flange was three eighths, and he said, "Oh, must be a misprint, so it has to be three quarters of an inch." So we bit it with a three-quarter inch flange, and we got the job. And the detailer called up or sent an RFI to the engineer and said, well, um, it, it appears that you know there was a printing error that these should be three-quarter inch flanges. And, it, the, and the response from the uh, engineer was, no, that three-eighths is what it is. If you put in a three-quarter inch flange, uh, you're going to have to redesign all the girders. And so the detailer said, OK. And so we made them with 3 8 inch flanges. Uh, they don't satisfy the AASHTO specifications. They don't satisfy the B over T, nor do they satisfy that requirement that the flange has to be uh, uh, thicker than the web. In this case, the flange was 3 8 and the web thickness was only, um, um, the flange thickness was only 3 8 uh, This is what it shows. Uh, what happens is then, as you move out into the span or towards the support where you have a non-composite, you need a bigger top flange. And this was the 3 8 flange, and this was this. This indicates uh, another potential problem is that this, this is a, a very large change in thickness. That should have been something that was caught. Uh, the, what, long story short is uh, we finally got wrote a letter to the engineer and the owner saying these don't satisfy the specifications. And the call back was, well, have you built them? And we said, yes, we had. And so we had to go in and, and add a cover plate, bolted cover plate, to satisfy those. Uh, the, 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 the moral in that story is if you get a, uh, an RFI from a detailer questioning something, uh, pay attention to it. The detailers looked at probably thousands of bridges, and he's trying to, he, when he sees something like that, he's trying to spot it and say, you know, this doesn't look right. Take a look at it. Um, if you write back to him and says, no, that's the way it's going to be, he's not going to argue with you. You're the engineer. But uh, it sometimes uh, yeah, is important to pay attention to the wisdom of the, the people that have been in the business. So this slide just shows all the little processes that goes into to fabricating a girder. And so we're going to go through and step through the process and, and look at some of the things that are done in the fab shop. So let's first start with the, the raw material. Uh, we typically, most fabricators, bridge fabricators, do not stock the material for the bridges. So once they get the job, the first thing you do is order the material. So that's, that's in, in the case of the thing I just talked about where there was a question on the 3 8 plate, this was done very early in the job. And, and the, when he said that, well, it's got to be 3 8 we ordered it because we can't uh, waste time uh, at the front end because of the delay in terms of scheduling it in the shop. So what you see here, the, the plates you see stacked up are all for a job that's in process. Um, the, the limit on plate length is typically 80 feet, and that's governed by rail cars. So we'll, if we can we'll, and we, if we need, uh, we'll order the plate in 80-foot lanes. Now there's different uh, mill lead times. Um, if we're looking at typically grade 50 material, um, then it's four to eight weeks. Uh, when we get to higher strength, 70W, it can extend out to 10 weeks. Roll beams can be a little quicker, but they're fairly comparable with the grade 50 material. In every case, the material is not stock. So the first thing that 
what's done by the fabricator when he gets a job is the detailer will give them a list of materials that goes to their purchasing agent, and they start shopping for the material. This is how the material comes in. We get it in a large plane length, and then uh, we will splice it to, uh, to if it needs to be longer. We also trim the edges of the plates. When it comes in from the mill, it has a raw mill edge. We'll, we'll cut these two edges. You can see the trim pieces laying over here on the side. So we'll trim it to the proper width, and then, uh, then the next thing will be um, to uh, do any splicing. Um, if they were splicing the flanges and webs, it'll be full penetration welds. And we'll talk about what we want to do with flanges is nest the flange plates if possible. We trim the mill edges. After we've got everything welded, we'll rip the flange plates to width from wider plates. Uh, if they have, if it um, can be, um, uh, if we can, if we can do it by um, Heat, heat curving will heat curve it afterwards, but if we'll have uh, tight radiuses, uh, then we're going to have to uh, cut curve them. Um, the webs uh, are cut curved for the desired camber. So what we do is we get your camber diagram. We'll use that to set the cutting of the webs. The webs will be cut to the desired camber, plus maybe some adjustment for weld shrinkage. When we weld, the welding we use is called fusion welding. Uh, it's a, we use a consumable electrode, uh, which along with the base metal is melted to form the weld. We use an arc or resistant heating in the flux to provide the heat to melt the base metal. There's typically a shielding gas that's part of the process to protect the molten metal and spray from the electrode from actually melting or actually uh, Actually, it's, it's melting. It could actually ignite and, and burn in the, in the oxygen in the atmosphere. Then there's a flux to clean the molten well metal pool and also used to produce the shielding gases in a submerged dark weld. Base metal chemistry must be controlled for welding. Since we're going to uh, be melting the material, essentially what we're doing with fusion welding is we're making steel in a small electric furnace. The composition of that steel is going to be a function of the electrode composition and the base metal composition. So we have to have um, chemistry controls on our steels. If you look at uh, older bridge steels, uh, there was very little control over the chemistry before there was welding. But once we introduced welding, we had to have very strict chemistry controls to provide a weldable steel. We look at the, uh, the process that maybe you're seen the most or the old-fashioned way of welding is uh, shielded metal arc welding or stick welding where we use a rigid electrode with a, a flux covered and uh, what happens in the uh, when we get this uh, close to the base metal an arc forms which that heat of the arc melts the, into the base metal and then also uh, melts the electrode and there's a transfer of the, the electrode uh, melted material by spray into this weld pool. It's protected by a gas shielding which comes from the flux covering and there's the flux also then forms to produce a slag on the surface which uh, is a way to cleanse the, the base metal. What, what this is, a, this would be a completely typically manual operation where the welder is controlling importantly the arc length and the speed of travel. To uh, eliminate uh, some of the, the variables uh, in, and make it um, easier to weld, uh, modern welding is typically done with a, a, in this case, a tubular electrode. This electrode has a metal tube with the inside uh, being flux, so it's a flux cord arc welding process and we use an external shielding gas. So there's an external shielding gas, and then we have the flux contained on the inside of the electrode. Uh, this is typically done uh, for the smaller welds in bridges. Um, 
and um, it's a, um, a uh, if you look at it, it can be an automated process. A semi-automatic process is that the wire feed is controlled. If we completely automate it, then we can also control the travel of the um, of the electrode holder. Most of the welds and bridges are done by the submerged arc process. Uh, this is an interesting process because uh, what it does is the weld is actually occurring in an area covered by the flux. The flux is a granular flux that's deposited ahead of the, the weld arc, and then the arc is actually in the flux. And so this is why they call it submerged arc. It's when you actually look at this system, and we'll show you a picture of it, you actually see no arc. Okay, it's covered under the flux. So this is a also produces a very high deposition rate. This, this whole blanket of molten flux tends to concentrate the heat, and we get a deeper weld. And that's, that's important in terms of giving us more deposition. Obviously, this also has to be uh, in, normally is an automated process. This, these two pieces move on a gantry, and this is making sure the flux is, a, is uh, put down before we get to the, uh, the welding position. What's going on when we when we weld is um, we're we're making steel. So in this area right here, we're showing a uh, just a typical weld bead. And this area here is area of molten steel. Uh, the steel co cools by conduction of the heat into the base plate. Um, if the bigger the, the the plate, the thicker the plate the bigger the heat sink. And so the more rapid cooling that it can, 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 can occur in the weld, and in particular in the heat affected zone, which we'll talk about right now and in the next slide. But in this area right here, um, we have a very steep thermal gradient and fairly uh, rapid cooling in this area. And what, what's, um, what can occur there is if we don't control the cooling, we can form a very hard microstructure called martensite, uh, which is uh, not desirable. This just shows uh, this a little bit in terms of the metallurgy of it. On the right-hand side, this is the iron carbon phase diagram. And, and so steels, the steels we're welding are typically in this range, this percent carbon or less. And so what, what happens is, is we, we, when we make the steel or make it in the uh, weld pool, we're starting up with a liquid, and then it's going to cool down. And as it cools down, it then forms austenite. And then it goes into this mixed area of austenite and ferrite. And then it finally gets down to here, it's ferrite plus something called cementite. So actually what's going on as we go down this temperature is the, the crystalline structure of the steel is changing. And if we try and if we go too quickly from here down to this temperature, we can form martensite. And so you've seen this, you've heard of quenched and tempered steels, and uh, our high strength bolts are also quenched and tempered. What they do is they do. They quench it in an oil bath to get it down to here to form the hard martensite, and then they take it back up and temper it to uh, give it the, the, uh, the toughness that's needed. Well, we're not going to do that in this steel, we're not in our welds, we're not gonna go back and heat treat them. So we want to make sure that in this, when we're cooling down here in this heat affected zone, that we don't cool, form any martensite. And you can understand also that as you go to higher carbon steels, you move out into this range, um, the longer you're in this austenite range and, and the more likely you are to form uh, martensite. So we control the carbon. This shows, um, a typical cross-section of a weld after it's been made. So this is a, a two-pass weld. This weld was made, for, this pass was put in first. The second pass was put up here. And you can see this gray shaded area here. That's the area that's the heat affected zone. What we mean by that, that the structure of the steel in that area has been influenced by the heat introduced by welding. And so, if we look at this again, we can divide these into regions. 
and this is showing it a little bit broader than it actually is. It's actually fairly narrow like this. But there's a there's an area here where we may see some grain growth, and uh, and then in this area, some where we've had some recrystallization, and you go through these various phases of the heat affected zone. What we want to do is make sure in this area that we don't cool too quickly. So to do that, we control that by preheat. And these are the preheat uh, and interpass temperatures uh, from uh, AWS D1.5, that is the, the bridge welding code. And what you see is, is that the higher strain steels moved down have higher preheat temperatures. And as we go to thicker material going in this direction, you also see the preheat goes up. The reason is, again, um, the thicker steels um, or thicker plates are bigger heat sinks, so we need to preheat those to a higher temperature to slow the cooling rate of the, of the weld metal and the heat affected zone. Also, as we go to higher strain steels, we typically have more alloy content, and they are, that increases their susceptibility to forming martensite. So we control that by controlling the temperatures. So this is an important variable that's controlled uh, during the, t the testing or the making of the, the girders. Thinner material down here it can be, this basically can be done at room temperature. But as we go to thicker materials, we're going to have to preheat to a higher temperature. So how do we make sure the, the welding that we're doing is going to provide uh, the desired quality? And this is done through a, a weld procedure specification that's based on test plates that the fabricator does. And the purpose of these is to demonstrate that the, the weld process uh, provides the strength and ductility and notch toughness requirements. This is done by checking a test plate. Once you do that, that generates a procedure qualification re record, a PQR, that then documents the welding variables that the welder in the shop is to use. There isn't an exemption. The old stick electrode is exempt for the lower strength steels. And tack welds that are used uh, to temporarily hold the pieces together but are subsequently remelted by the submerged arc welds are not um, re required to go through this procedure qualification. And small welds on ancillary products are typically not included. Now the basis of the uh, controlled variables for the welder is the heat input, how much heat you're putting in. And this is measured by uh, kilojoules per inch. Okay, So we're looking that heat input is the amperage times the voltage times a proportionality factor to get it into kilojoules divided by the travel speed. So this is the amperage and voltage is typically set uh, at the machine. This is controlled by how fast you're moving your gantry. Um, when you're making the test weld, uh, each pass must be in, in within 10% of the overall average. And uh, the table 5.1 gives the maximum amperage for each um, process. There are three ways you can qualify. One is the maximum heat input qualification, where you do it at the maximum heat input. Uh, and you are allowed to go down to 60% of that heat input. So you have a range of heat inputs that you can use on your welt. There's another way to do it, which is a maximum minimum, where you do a maximum test and the minimum, and then you have to be between those. And then there's a special case for you doing actually an unusual weld, and you have to qualify it using a production procedure qualification. So that might be something um, where you're doing a non-standard joint or a submerged arc weld with an active flux. An active flux is a flux that will actually alloy the material, the weld. And um, some matching electrodes for the high strength HPS material. Most fabricators will qualify under this requirement. So that you, once they make the production plate, they have a range that they can use uh, to, for their welds. This is what the test plate looks like. This is right from the AWS specification. You weld up these plates. The joint down here is a very unusual joint. Okay, 
It's not what you would use in a typical bridge. It's a wider root opening. If, if this on this one for a smurge arc well, the root opening is five eighths, uh, has a fairly narrow groove. The purpose of doing this is to be able to get these all weld metal tension specimens out. That's right in here, shown in one end and in length here, and also the weld metal Sharpie V notch specimens that are concentrated in the center line. So we need a, a fairly wide weld that uh, will allow us to get these pieces out. Once this is made, in the, the all weld metal tension test is made, side bends where you bend these, a reduced section transverse specimen here, a reduced section transverse here, side bends and side bends, plus macro etches on every one of these. So what happens is the fabricator makes this test plate. It's shipped off to a testing lab, and they perform all these tests and come back with a, a written report. It's quite an extensive amount of testing. and requires a, a fair, is a fair amount of cost involved. This gives you some idea of the total number of specimens that are required. In addition, you have to do um, RT of the, um, of the weld. And if it's a narrow gap, electroslag, you have to do UT. So all of that is done, and if it passes those requirements that are specified for the strength level that you're doing, then that is an acceptable uh, qualification plate and will be used then to develop the PQRs. So this is a, a requirement. And there's, it doesn't mean that every month this is done. There's typically most states will accept it for a year or up to five years. And if you haven't changed anything, you can still use the same um, PQR. He shows you the test requirements for the weld metal. And um, you can see that they have the sim what you would expect, similar yield strength and tensile strength comparable to the base metal, uh, fairly large elongation. But what's most important is to look at the test temperatures here for the Sharpie specimens. They're actually much lower in most cases than the base metal. And when you go to zone three, they're, they're, far, they're pretty far down. Um, w what this means is that typically the weld metal will be matching or exceed the strength of the uh, base metal, and it'll have higher toughness than the base metal requirements. Um, it doesn't mean that it will always be higher because there, some of the base metal will come, may come in higher than the specifications, but the requirements for the weld are higher than the base metal. The far right is the requirements for fracture critical. And again, they're at um, a fairly low temperatures relative to the um, base metal. Now, let's talk about how we weld. Uh, we use butt welding of flanges. And there's typically, it'll be either by smudge arc welding or narrow gap electroslag welding. And we'll talk about how we want to nest the girder flanges. Um, the welding of the web to the flange and plate girders and tub girders, we'll, we'll show how that's done. These are typically fillet welds. And as you know, as a designer, typically the, the weld sizes are controlled by the plate thickness, not by the strength. Um, but these are continuous fillet welds that are used to join the web to the flange. So we'll look at uh, what, what, what we go through to make a, a submerged arc weld. What we need to do is uh, we're going to have to bevel the plate. This shows a bevel here. And this shows a, one being trimmed. This is another. Uh, this is actually a flange thickness transition. And this is a trimming of it. But what this is the preparation that goes into the plate before it's welded. And the reason we have to put the V groove is to provide access for the electrode to the bottom of the weld. The weld will be made in multiple passes. On the, uh, what we do is when we've got them uh, beveled, we'll tack weld them to hold them together, and then, um, then make the weld. And this is the typical kind of things you might see in a shop where they're designating the type of weld to be used. And this is just telling you it's a fracture critical member. This shows the setup all ready to weld, where we have uh, a flange thickness transition. As we'll talk about later, this is the preferred place to do it, to make your flange thickness transition in, in the weld. 
And what we have is runoff tabs here, runoff tabs here that are where we start and stop the well. This shows a well being put in. This is a submerged arc well. It shows again the runoff tabs where he ends the well out here. He has the one on the other side where he's starting. Um, this shows schematically what's going on in the equipment. Here's the, the wire feed is coming down through here. The flux is being put. I'm sorry, I'm, this is actually the flux. The wire feed is back here. And um, he's, this is a track that he's running it on. And so he sets it up and welds it. He's uh, actually, he doesn't have a vacuum. He's just scraping off the flux in the back here. This is, um, to give you some idea, you can see the width of the weld, and he's going to take multiple passes to make this weld. The number of passes will be a function of the plate thickness. He's going to make the welds from one side, and then he's going to have to flip the plate over, back gouge under here, and weld the back side. This just shows a close-up to show you the, the submerged arc. So the flux is coming in right in here, and the wires wire feeds down here and the flux is coming in here. But you can see that down in here, this is where the, all the action is, but it's completely submerged. Once that side is welded, then he has to back gouge, so he uses an air arc gouge to gouge out the root to sound metal, then grinds it smooth, and uh, then he's ready now to put in the weld passes on the other side. So what has happened here is you've welded one side of the plate. You have to flip the plate over, uh, back gouge with an air arc, the, the root of the weld to sound metal, then go in and grind it, and then you're set up to weld the back side. When it's finished, uh, this is a completed weld where we've just got the same thickness plate. It's ground smooth and it's ready for inspection by radiography or ultrasonics, whatever is required. This is what a flange thickness looks like uh, when it's completed. The weld was actually made down here. Uh, this was where it was cut. Uh, the thicker plate was cut. And you can see how it's ground smooth. Um, the grinding sh should be very smooth, not to introduce any stress concentrations. Now we'll look at another way to do this kind of welding, this butt welding, which is to use narrow gap electro slag welding. And this is a single pass, and it's done vertical. Uh, there, it was uh, used quite a lot early on, and then there was a problem that occurred on a bridge in Pittsburgh, and um, there was a moratorium on this for contention members. That was lifted by the Federal Highway in, in March of 2000, and in, was in 2010 it was adopted into the... Uh, T1.5 specification. Advantages is a single pass vertical weld, no turning of the plates, no back gouging, all of that. No, it's fast. It uh, approximately five to ten increase in productivity. Uh, you're talking about two to one and a half inches a minute, a three foot long weld in about an hour. Completely automated equipment, computer controlled wire and flux feed as well as voltage control. It's a very automated process. Single vertical up weld, it's a molten weld metal is contained by water-cooled copper shoes. So we're gonna basically cast this weld vertically. So we have to have uh, shoes on the side to contain the molten weld metal. The biggest thing that was introduced was to narrow the gap. Uh, there's no edge preparation. You use square edge preparation and you have a considerable guide tube to control the welding wire. It's a submerged arc process. The molten flux pool is on the top of the weld mill. That's where the heating is occurring. It shows it just sort of schematically. You can see the two plates. This is the uh, molten slag pool. This is the weld metal down here. These are the shoes that are being on the sides of the weld to keep them the material from just flowing out the sides. So we're, we're casting the weld vertically up. This shows three electrodes. Typically, in, in the, now in the modern narrow gap, the most you'll use is two electrodes, 
the, amount, the number of electrodes you use as a function of the thickness of the plate. The biggest change, well, we, we started off with very wide gaps, inch and a half. That was the old process. If the, if the guide tube got off to one side, what you'd get is a large incomplete fusion over here. Uh, if you have that same misfit with a narrow one, uh, we don't see that happening. Uh, the heating is such that we, we always fuse this area. So it took care of some problems that occurred with the wide groove. Uh, in addition, it changed the angle of the solidification. Uh, with the wide um, gap, we were getting this, uh, the angle between the grains of greater than 90 degrees, a very deep weld pool. With a narrow gap, the weld pool is not as deep. We get a difference in the grain solidification and a much higher resistance to cracking. So what's included in the specification is really control of this um, amount of welding or um, amount of heating that we're going to do. Um, and what, what's different about this process is the welding variables has to be modified as we change thickness. And so you can't just do it at one heat of an input because you vary the heat input based on the thickness. Where all the action and what you must control is the depth of the slag pool. That's shown here. This is a cast weld metal. And what we've done is stop the weld before it reached the end. And so you can see this is where the wire was in there and melting the flux. This is where we have the cast metal, which is a function of the base metal and the wire. The chemistry of the electro slag weld is much more influenced by the chemistry of the base metal almost 50% uh, base metal in here and 50% wire. This shows a test uh, setup being, so we're making a test weld, but it shows you typically what happens. There's square preparations, nothing fancy. We have down at the bottom a sump where we start the weld. So we start the weld down here, get it stabilized, and then it moves on. This is similar to the runoff tabs that are used in submerged arc welding. Um, one thing you have to do is you have to remove the mill scale uh, adjacent to the, the weld, and that's done typically with a grinder. But there's square edge preparation. It shows the top of the weld. It shows the guide tube going in. This is a flux feeder. This is a cooling shoe. It's water cooled. And this is the, uh, the end block, which is used to end the weld off, off of the main plate. Shows a, a two-wire guide tube. This is a, a more modern version where rather than using circular tubes, we're using flat plates with grooves, uh, bent grooves in them where the wire goes down to here. Uh, the specification uh, has limits on the dimensions of these and the spacing of these wires relative to the uh, uh, plate thickness. This shows a, a system all ready to go. We've got the guide tube down here. These are ceramic spaces, spacers to keep the guide tube from hitting the, the steel. If, it, if the guide tube uh, hits the steel, is in, in contact, it'll form an arc there. It'll melt the guide tube, and the wire won't feed. So it's very important to have that. We're just about ready now to put the, uh, in this one over here, we would put the cooling shoes on and we'd be ready to weld. This shows the cooling shoes in, shoes on, the daisy chained up. This goes, the water goes to a cooling unit and circulated to keep the, uh, the system, the water from getting too hot. And it's a completely controlled system. So the flux is being added at the top, the wire is being added, the control of all of that's by computer as well as we're monitoring the voltage. This just shows you up close uh, when you're making a weld. This is actually this red part here is showing you where the weld is going on. And he has his finger on the cooling shoe to show you how effective the cooling shoe is. Remember that what we're doing is extracting the heat out of here into the cooling shoe, into the water and out. So it's a very effective way. So that's a, the mold, if you wish, for the weld. This is at the top, of, excuse me, and you can see we finished off. This is a, 
the guide tube is melted, and you can see down here the molten weld metal. So this is the end block where we finish the weld. This is a completed test weld. The next thing would be to cut off the runoff tabs or the sump and the end block, grind this smooth, and go ahead and inspect it. Uh, but it, it's fast. It's the only thing that takes time with this is the setup. These are large plates. That, we're talking about long, large plates. It takes a while to set up everything, put all the cooling shoes in, and get everything adjusted. So it's only advantageous to use if you have very wide plates. This shows a cross-section of a, um, a weld. This was actually a test weld in early on. Not, actually, it wasn't done in our shop. It was done in another shop. But it shows you, here's the cast weld metal. Uh, here's the fusion line, and this is the heat affected zone. Now let's talk about flange sizing, because we've just talked to show you how we spliced them. Uh, it's recommended that if you're going to change flange width, to do it at the field splice. This allows the welds to be slabbed, which we'll show in just a minute. Allowing flange thickness transition to allow slabbing. We'll point this out. And minimize the number of plate thicknesses. Remember, plates come in 12 foot width and 80 foot length. And if you just need a 3 foot wide, 20 foot plate, we have to buy that whole plate, and there's a lot of waste. And so it, it, the guiding light should be design it like you're going to build it. You wouldn't normally want to build something where you change plate sizes through every girder. And that would you would realize that that would be a lot of extra waste of material. So to give you an example of why you don't want to uh, do your flange thickness, flange width changes away from uh, field splices, if we if we do the girder like this, where you have um, a flange thickness transition like this, what this means is every one of these welds has to be done individually. And so we have everyone, you have to do all that setup on each one of these. You have to do all the back gouging and turning and everything on each flange. Um, a better way to do it is to, to change the flange thickness rather than the flange width. So what we'll do is we'll take this thicker plate in the center. We'll bevel the ends uh, for weld. We'll taper this to match the thickness of this. And once we've done that, we can weld them. And so we'll weld that in one pass. We we'll only have two welds and two, two places to weld and grind versus the uh, large number that we had, eight, on the other one. Once we've done that, put it on the burning table and burn out the flange width. And now we have four flanges from that one assembly. This greatly increases the production of the, of the, of the flanges. Um, it may at first seem wasteful. You may, you may uh, say, if this is a thicker plate, you may say, well, I didn't need that length down here. But actually, it's cheaper for us and it's more efficient to go ahead and say, well, I'll put this extra thicker plate out here uh, because it allows the fabricator to slab these. Uh, the cost of material is small relative to the cost of all that extra handling and welding. Let's talk about when you should consider a flange uh, uh, width. Okay, don't do them if you have to, unless you have to. It increases costs about 35%. If you do it, do it a bolted splice, and don't clip the corners; just leave square corners. Allow the fabricators to eliminate splices within a shipping piece by carrying the thicker material through to the next design splice. Let them look at and talk to you about changing some of the design to make it more efficient. And again, remember the detailer is talking to you has done a lot of bridges, so he, he knows that it's been done in the past. How many foot splices within a shipping piece when to change the area? A good rule of thumb is no more than two thicknesses within uh, or two shop splices within a field piece. That may be three different thicknesses or two different thicknesses, depending on the symmetry. Uh, you shouldn't consider changing 
And unless you, uh, you're changing more than an eighth of an inch on up to about two and a half inches, I'm thinking material it should be a quarter inch. And I'd actually sort of recommend a quarter inch as for all. I mean, you're not saving much material when you're just dropping down one eighth. Now, the maximum change, uh, the thinner piece should be at least half the thickness of the thicker. Uh, so you don't want to have uh, drastic changes in, in, um, in your thickness. And again, only when the material cost saved is greater than labor spent. Okay, so again, if we can nest them and, 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 and do that with one uh, weld as we just showed and uh, we don't have too many, um, then we're better off. So this shows uh, what happens when we have this. This is a total plate. This was plate laid on here. It's actually a flange splice here, and it was burnt. These, these on the burning table, so we rip out the flanges. So this is a very efficient way to do it. Now let's talk about. These are kind of girders that when when my detailer sees these, he used to call me and ask me if I taught the student. And, and so what we have is a typical negative moment region of a girder where we have very large flanges near the, at the pier. And what I want to point out, this little asterisk right here means that this is HPS 70. And what we've got, and if you look at this splice right here, this piece right here, this is a 21 foot long piece of two and a half inch plate of HPS 70. We have something similar over here. This is a three and a half inch thick uh, HPS plate. The rest of these are three inch, okay, which are common. So this plate becomes like a piece of gold. This is going to, we're going to have to buy the full length of that plate, 12 foot by 80 foot maybe, and just to rip out this one piece. A better solution is rather than going like this with these various thicknesses, is to change the width of the plates on the different girders. If you really need those differences, is change the width rather than the thickness, and then extend all the splices so that they have a common point so we can then slab them. So we can make all of these welds in one pass and then rip out these different widths. That's much more efficient than uh, what's on the left. Now let's talk about how we attach the, um, the webs to the flanges. If it's a plate girder, what we do is put the web horizontal, and we have a hydraulic ram here, which is pushing on this flange, and then it's reacted over on the other side so that we're bending the flange to match the cut camber in the web. And these guys are tacking the, uh, the web to the flange, so it's a temporary weld that then we'll use to uh, hold the girder in shape so that we can make the continuous weld. This is how we make the continuous weld the flange, web to flange welds. Uh, this is, and, and I should say, this is the way it's done in one of our shops. Each shop will have a different setup for this. But typically, you'll, you'll make two welds at the same time. We're welding both sides of the web simultaneously. This is the, it's using submerged arc. It's actually with, you see ahead of here, some preheat. Uh, this is actually, I think, a dual wire system. Um, we typically, this is all completely automatic. Once he makes this, he'll turn the girder over and finish up the other side. The next step will be to fit the stiffeners. So the stiffeners are fit. They're tack welded in place, and they're in the right position. Then we weld the stiffeners using submerged arc welding. But this is using what is called a dart welder, where we weld both sides at the same time. This is one of the reasons why we don't like quarter-inch stiffeners, because if we try and do this on a quarter-inch stiffener, we'll burn right through. So this is something to keep in mind. Box girders or tub girders are a little bit more difficult. Um, you, have, uh, you can't get access um, to both sides uh, because of the cross frames. So the way it's done in, in one of our shops is we weld the web to, one, to the top flange. We use the same equipment that we use to make eye girders. We fit the stiffeners in and weld those. And then we take that and assemble it into a box. So this is one web flange assembly. We have another one over here. And we use the cross frames here 
to hold the geometry of the two webs, and he's jacking the flange up to match the camber in the web. It's very important in terms of the way we fabricate it, and most fabricators do it, is to use bolted cross frames. This allows us to put these together in the shop, hold this geometry, and then bring the, uh, the, the bottom flange up. You can see that we, we, this is not going to be a very automatic process. We can do this as a continuous weld on the outside. But the inside, we have to go around each stiffener. So this is more of a manual process. It's one of the reasons why tub girders tend to be a little bit more expensive. One of the issues we need to just discuss a little bit is what happens with um, when we weld. We, when we cast the metal here, when it wants to cool down, it's going to, at first it's going to extract heat out there. It wants to expand, but it's soft. When it solidifies, it wants to shrink down. And that's going to be restrained by the base metal surrounding it. What happens is, will generate tension residual stresses at the site that cools last. So associated with the fusion welding will be the generation of residual or locked-in stresses in the vicinity of the weld. And this just shows some measurements that were done on um, welded girders. Um, these are fairly representative of what you see. And what you see is that the over the web to flange area, both cases here, we've got high tension residual stresses. We also see high residual tension stresses at the edges of the flange, and that's due to the flame cutting. So one, when we fabricate these girders, we're going to have these locked in residual stresses. You may be aware of it. That's why particularly the, the compression residual stress here actually controls the compression flange behavior. And why, that's why we have an inelastic uh, curve that starts down at about half of yield, because what's going to happen is we, we put compression residual stresses. These areas are going to yield at a lower than load, and that will reduce the stiffness of this compression flange. And so that's accounted for in the specifications. If we look at what's after we do afterwards, we have to inspect the welds. We have to look inside, uh, and we'll do that with uh, radiography and, and uh, ultrasonics. If it's fillet welds, we'll use a, use a visual and magnetic particle. Um, the, uh, this is what visual inspection would be looking at this weld, which is, it wouldn't pass because it's not very uniform. We're going to look at the sizes of the welds. So these are fillet welds going to be looking at, and these are things that the inspector will do visually. If we want to look further at the welds for cracking and near surface defects, typically use magnetic particle inspection, where we introduce a magnetic field into the steel. Uh, then we put a, a magnetic particles on the top, that is, steel, I should say ferromagnetic particles on the top which will then line up if there's a break in the magnetic field, and they'll show up like this. So you can see we've de detected some cracking here. This is what it looks like afterwards. So you introduce the magnetic field. You put a very fine red iron powder on it. It lines up on the cracks, and it makes it very easy to see these. Um, this is uh, one on an internal crack. So this is... Uh, Typically, the way we look at fillet welds, we look at uh, butt welds. We'll look at using radiography. We can we can look at it uh, using gamma rays, uh, a nuclear source or X-ray source. What we're looking for is internal defects. It's very good for volume-related uh, defects, and it has provides a, a visual record. It has some problems, particularly with gamma ray sources, is the shielding you must and the distance you must be. This is uh, where the, uh, the source is going to be pushed out to, the radioactive isotope. Underneath here is a film holder. So the film will be placed underneath, and that will measure the amount of radiation that gets through the weld. This is just to give you some idea of what happens when you do that. that 
you have to stay this far away from where the radiograph is being taken. So typically this is done at night where you move the plate out of the shop and do it outside. But you, it is a radiation hazard. What you end up with is this, if you have a, a thinner material or an internal defect, more of the radiation will get through to the film. And this is, turns out as a negative. So what you'll see is a dark area in this area on the film if uh, we have a less uh, material. We use, uh, have to use uh, different isotopes depending on the thickness. If you have to go to very thick material, greater than three inches, you have to go to cobalt 60, which is, um, has a short half-life and, and is a little dangerous to use. Typically, we want to stay in this range. Well, typically, we can to stay less than three-inch plate. Then we can, it can be radiographed with normal um, gamma ray sources. This is what a uh, radiograph looks like. This is a radiograph. This is a defect here at the, at the root of it. There's some cracking. This is what it looks like in the radiograph up here. Uh, this is a little more diffuse. There's some lack of fusion here, lack of penetration, and porosity. This is uh, the, after the radiograph is made, then the inspector goes into a darkened room and reads that radiograph and determines whether you've passed. It can be a very tedious and difficult process uh, because hopefully he's looking at radiographs that don't show anything, and then he has to be alert to see when a defect shows up. But you can see that they show up as dark areas on the film. Ultrasonic inspection is similar to radar or sonar. It, what we're going to do is interrogate the weld using high-frequency waves, typically two and a quarter megahertz. What is we send the sound in and we wait for the sound to be reflected back from the metal air interface. That would be where we would have a de defect. And we get the sound reflected back because there's a difference in the velocity of sound in the metal versus the air. It's portable and there's no radiation hazard, so it's, it's very nice to use in the shop. We can do it in a variety of ways. One is to use what is called a compression wave where we have a longitudinal wave where the sound travel and the wave motion is in the same direction. Or we can use a shear wave where the sound propagation is this way, but the particle motion is transverse. Typically, we'll use a, a shear wave transducer. It shows you how we do it. We send the sound in, and typically it will reflect it off the back surface. There's a flaw there. It will reflect the sound back in into the probe. So what happens is the probe is constantly pulsing out sound and listening. And this is happening very frequent, at a very fast rate. The operator will move the transducer back and forth to get coverage of the weld. You'll look at it both sides to get, to get both sides covered. And so um, this, um, this is a manual process. Uh, he has to use a couplant between the transducer and the plate to transmit the sound in there. And what he'll record is the amount of sound coming back and that where the defect is. This is much what he might see if he found a defect. He's sending sound in along this line. This distance here represents this sound path. So he, this is really a time scale, but this is telling him how far from the transducer that the reflector is. And this is indicating the the reflected sound. The transducer and the equipment has to be calibrated using a calibration block that we calibrate against to make sure that he's accurate in terms of sound. And we set up a reference level of a 16th inch side drill hole. A newer technology is, is phased array, which is similar to what you may have seen in a medical field um, and uh, is used uh, to make sonograms. In this situation, we have uh, transducers with multiple elements, which can be then focused to, to produce uh, a variety of angles, if you wish. And what this does is provides you, we can, with two scanning locations, we can look over this whole weld. And uh, it's included in this. This is, we can then generate uh, something that looks like a radiograph where we can actually show where the defects are. 
this just shows also the other advantages. We can look at it rather than just the A scan that you would get from a normal ultrasonics. We can look at it as if we're looking in the side or top of the plate and get something that looks more like a radiograph. All of this information can be stored digitally. This just shows setting up a weld to be uh, scanned in uh, the Federal Highway Lab. And the actual scanning is going on here. He's using a position transducer so he knows where the transducer is along the length of the weld. He's recording all the data. And he gets ends up with a digital record of the inspection. If you normally with the uh, ultrasonics, if everything's no thing is found, you just get an OK. But in this case, you'll have a digital record. It's less operator de dependent, but requires experienced users to set up the equipment. It can be faster than conventional UT. There's no radiation or hazard. And it's now recognized in AWS D1.5. There's further work going on to refine the process and to enhance uh, uh, its ability. Final thing we do is we do it throughout the job. We do in-process inspection to make sure the dimensions are right and that things are followed up. Um, this, there are whole points along the fabrication process that they have to go through. If we've got a girder that has some sweep, we may heat curve it. This shows you a, a curved girder and lay down. As we're going to lay down another one over here. You can imagine if we have uh, two curved girders and this starts going up into the sky. That's one of the reasons why we only lay down at most two pieces if we want full lay down of a curved girder, it can't be done. This shows a lay down of a um, straight girder. And when we say a lay down, what we're doing here is we're laying the two pieces, two girder pieces together to determine uh, the geometry of this splice. And this is the what we call the old fashioned way. And what we have at the splice, we have the flange, it has no holes in it, but we have a splice plate. So we're going to use the splice plate as a template to drill the holes manually. This shows it on the flange, and this shows it on the web. Uh, and just to mention that this is too many bolts, but we'll talk about that later. Then what we have to do, if it's a tub girder, we'll manually drill these holes using a portable drill press. And we match drill every one of these holes. This shows a, a finished girder, and just to give you an idea of what it means like in terms of holes. If you look at this splice plate, there are four on the rows in the, in the web. There's a total of 312 bolts in this connection, or 936 holes. What's important in terms of the economy of bridges is the number of bolts. Uh, if you think about the time it takes out in the field to put in every one of those bolts and tighten this, uh, adding bolts uh, that are not needed uh, is um, really increases uh, cost in the field. This shows a girder splice, and this, guy, this splice has 634 bolts in each splice. Um, we have a new design method that's been approved by AASHTO, and I consider it, think you should look at that. It's much faster and easier to use. It has recommendations on how to do this but to reduce those number of bolts. We look at the new operation. Rather than doing all this um, lay down and drilling the holes in the solid like that, what we do now is um, cut and drill the plates on the cutting table, assemble the girders, and then measure where the holes are using a laser. Input that geometry to the computer and assemble the girders vir virtually on the computer and output the required splice plate geometry. So what we're going to do is pre-drill the flanges and webs and then custom make the splice plate. When it first started, uh, we did it on a research project with Paul Fox. And this was done, uh, sponsored by Virginia, and it was done on a Tennessee DOT girder. It shows you the girder that was done uh, in this. You can see it's not small. It was a full-size test. This shows you some of the data that you can get. Uh, in this one, we used a, a scanning uh, device. This shows uh, now some of the girders going through our shop. And what to notice is that we've got holes in the web. And that you can see this edge distance is a little long. It's, we do this on purpose so that we can trim this edge 
to meet the CAMBER requirements and any adjustments we need to make. This shows the, the girders fit together on the, on the floor. So we've laid them down, and what he's doing is cleaning them off. The, these have all been pre-drilled, and now what he's going to do is measure it with a laser tracker. So it's called a tracker because this laser will follow this device, and then he'll tell it each time he has it in the hole to take that measurement. This is what the uh, reflector looks like. You can use it on a great distance on a curved girder. The data looks like this. Uh, the data is, goes into a computer. This shows the three positions of the tracker that we had to use to get clear views. We have to, we have to be able to see these holes on the bottom here, these holes on the top and bottom over here. So on the flanges, you've got to have it on outside. Uh, this time we were using uh, a third position to get some of this. Now we can do it with just uh, these two positions. But this shows you locations of the holes and where the trackers were. Then we start developing more the a detail of it, and we end up with the splice plate. So we, we take that data from the tracker, input it into the CNC, make the splice plate. And this shows early on what we were doing. We were doing some physical matching. Now we do all of that on the computer. But you can see how it matches up. And these are the guys that do it. And it, when it, first, it was a remarkable thing. When you first do this all with the computer, you bring this plate out, and you say, is it going to fit? And it did. So in the short term, we're doing it this way. Um, we're now verifying the stack of plates on the computer. Uh, in the long term, we want to do it completely virtual to eliminate the laydown. And we're coming pretty close to that with, with iGERS. The savings is a lot of speed and a lot of time wasted. Uh, saved. In fact, uh, it, it eliminates uh, the delay that, of the hand drilling of the holes. The next step is painting and shipping, so we blast the girders. It's typically done in a wheel braider. These are the girders blasted. The next step will be to paint them, and sometimes three coats. This is painting the inside of a, a box girder. We paint them white, and something that started in Texas, but it greatly improves the inspection. Uh, this is not a, a, a thick corrosion protection coating. It's just to provide a light surface in there so it's easier to inspect. And then there's a final inspection. And this is usually in-house QC and also by the owners. And you can see this owner, has got, he's, got a, he's got a mirror down here, and he's looking in the web, the, uh, the cope on the stiffener to web, and checking that for paint. Next thing is to ship it, and we can ship it if it's too too tall. We'll ship it laying down. Typically, we have to get permission. If it's too long and tall, well, it will mean a special permit. This shows a steerable rear axle assembly on this girder. Also shows a stiffening truss used to provide lateral torsional buckling uh, capacity to the girder for the long span. If it's really big, then we'll ship it by rail. And this is last resort. Uh, we also have shipped by barge. These are the girders for the Tap and Z that went from our shop um, up to the Hudson River. Standard, uh, if, we, if we get 10 foot deep girder, we can ship it with uh, in parallel flanges. There's no problem. We can go up to about 12 feet if it's haunched. But uh, above that, uh, we're going to have to get permission from the, gir from the state to lay it down. That's one thing to think about in your design is to think about designing your girder so it can, if it's a very deep one, that it can be shipped with the web horizontal. To give you some idea of the permitting uh, requirements, uh, if it's you know 12 foot wide and 75 foot long or less, nothing special. We go to single permit if it gets taller and the length is uh, 120 feet or less. If it's over 120 feet, then we have to get uh, special permits, super load. And that requires additional days. Uh, and so if we can, if we, we can stay within the limits, it's important. If you're concerned, you can check with any of the fabricators, and they'll tell you what the various state requirements are. 
So if you look at the summary of what we've done, the welding and inspection is controlled by D1.5. We do PQRs to, gen to look at, to demonstrate we can make the weld. That develops a WPS. Thicker plates require higher preheats and greater welding skill. Submerged arc is the most commonly used welding process. Narrow gap electroslag is gaining. We're using RT, but it's slow and dangerous. UT is fast and portable, but no record. Phased array is coming online, which combines uh, advanced UT with a, a record. Remember that residual stresses are unavoidable and not calculated. They're accounted for in the specification. Virtual assembly of field splice on the computer works, greatly reduces it, uh, the need. We're, the, the fabricator is taking responsibility for the fit up by doing this. There's no reason to specify multiple laydowns uh, if we can do it uh, with a computer and precise measurements. The laser tracker we're measuring to less than a thousandth of an inch. Remember to design it like you're going to build it. It avoids short lanes of unique plates, space welded splices to allow slabbing, size field pieces to shipping lanes, and don't hesitate to ask the fabricator. So this is a good design of a nice simple bridge. This is a bridge in Texas. Those are actually box girders, very shallow, very pleasant looking bridge. Simple spans with the deck continuous. So at the end of the day, we finished the bridge. It's another, uh, another good day. Actually, this is morning in Texas because they cast the bridge decks at night in Texas when it's cool. So that ends this discussion, and I think we have some questions. Or do we have time? Yes, OK. Thanks, Carl. We do have a few questions that came in, but uh, before we do that, we want to do a couple polling questions to uh, see if the audience is still following along. So um, we ask that you participate in these. Um, here's our first question. True or false, higher preheat temperatures are used in thicker plates to reduce the amount of energy input into the weld. You can select your answer by clicking on the radio button next to true or false. Once again, the question is, true or false, higher preheat temperatures are used in thicker plates to reduce the amount of energy input into the weld. OK, let me go ahead and close that poll. We'll skip to the results. All right, Carl, we have pretty close split between true and false. Um, what is the correct answer? Yeah, it's actually false. Um, the energy is input you know, through the, uh, the arc parameters, which are the, uh, as we, we pointed out, which is amperage, voltage, and travel speed. That preheat is used to slow the cooling rate. And so when we go to higher preheats, that slows the cooling rate of the weld, and that's what it's for. OK, uh, let's do one more polling question, and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. Our next polling question, again, true or false, go ahead and uh, choose what you think is the best answer. True or false, changing flange area by changing the flange width in the field section is preferred. True or false, changing flange area by changing the flange width in the field section is preferred. All right, I think we'll go ahead and close the poll. And about 70% said this is false. Do you agree, Carl? Yeah, that's, a, that's correct. Well, Remember, we, we don't want to, if you change the width in the field section, that means we can't slab the welds. And so it's, um, it's preferred to do any changes in width at the field splice, not within the field section. 
Okay, let's get to uh, a few questions before we're out of time here. Um, let me go to slide 37. Uh, in the, the last bullet point for exempt, the last one listed says welds of ancillary products. Can you explain what ancillary products is referring to? <laughs> yeah, anything that's not a girder. Uh, that's a, that's a good. That's just that wording comes directly out of AWS. But it would be uh, typically if you you know you have um, 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 a latch for a um, um, an inspection um, piece or a, a ladder that would be uh, coming off the bridge, they wouldn't be covered by the bridge welding code. Okay. And then just for some clarification on a couple of these uh, abbreviations um, for for the welding, uh, what can you remind us again? What does ESW stand for, and what does NSW stand for? Oh, okay. Uh, first one is electro slag welding, and then <clears throat> then what we go back to is we have narrow cap electro slag welding. So we ended put the NG in front of it to differentiate between the new process, which is narrow gap, versus the old process, which you use to wide gap. Okay. All right. Um, here's a question. Um, if you get a flaw detected during the non-destructive testing, how do you fix? Okay, yeah, and, and let's let's be clear that there there are, there are acceptable uh, discontinuities that are allowed, but if if it comes above the threshold that's allowed, uh, what we have to do is we have to go in and gouge out that weld metal and do a weld repair. So and then then we go through a, an inspection after that. So if it doesn't um, meet the inspection requirements, we have to remove that uh, flaw. And uh, reweld it, and then reinspect it. Okay. Um, the next question has to do with uh, curving the girder. When, when in the process is the girder heat curved? Uh, it's done. Uh, typically, it's done. Well, it's actually required before you put the stiffeners on. So after you, you've, you've attached the flange to the web, then you'd heat curve it. Okay. All right, we probably have time for one or two more questions. I'm going to go to 79. Uh, question about camber. Um, this presentation focused on plate girders, but how is camber created in rolled beam bridges? Is it done with a hydraulic press, or is the natural camber only used? No, uh, you can heat camber. You can uh, camber by heating uh, the girder. Um, and, and some states allow uh, cold uh, gagging to uh, to make the camber. But the it, and it depends then on you know what the shop is set up to do. Typically, you know you typically the camber on roll beams is not too large, and can, it's not too hard to put in. But um, it you know with most shops can put in uh, camber in a rolled shape, rolled shape, and they'll they'll do it either by cold gagging or uh, by heat depending on their preference. Okay. And then one last question, and we'll wrap things up. Um, when it comes to residual stresses, has laser, laser or water jet cutting been used to minimize the residual stresses? Oh, okay. That's a good question. Uh, laser doesn't really help you that much. Uh, the residual stresses are caused by the, the, uh, the heat if you take the steel to, and it's, it's about the same, although the heat input may be a little bit less. But uh, in both of those um, technologies, it's it's very difficult to, to to get the equipment to go through the thickness of plates that we need to. 
although water jet is starting to creep in um, a little bit. Lasers are typically limited to about inch to an inch and a half material thickness. So they're not of much use in terms of doing flanges. And the equipment is also very expensive. So we, it's, it's, um, we, we learn to live with those residual stresses. Remember that even if we change how we cut the plates, you're still going to have the high residual stress from the welding. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. So if your question did not get answered today, uh, we'll work with Dr. Frank to uh, address those questions and send you the answers in the near future via email. If instead you're signed up for that eight-session package, uh, we provide a certificate only for the registrant, and we'll provide that certificate at the conclusion of the, t the entire course. Um, let's talk about a few items that go with that eight-session package. Um, you have you had access to the four recorded sessions that, uh, that came in advance of today's session. And as well, you have access to quizzes and um, the final exam. So the best place to find that is if you log into your AISC account and go to your course resources. And once you find this course, you can see a list of all of these resources, including handouts, the recordings, and quiz access. Um, these slides are in the back of your, your handout, by the way. So there's a lot of information here, but um, just a couple of items to note is uh, the quizzes for the live sessions will be available within two days of the live session. And um, actually, today's session, the quiz is already available. So if you go into your course resources, you will see it sitting there right now. Um, all quizzes are due on November 23rd. Uh, keep that in mind as you go along with this course. Um, why would you want to take the quiz? If you, do not, if you uh, watch the recording but not the live session, you have to take and pass the quiz to get PDHs. That's one reason. If you're looking to get a certificate of completion, AISC's EEU certificate, um, you need to pass seven of eight quizzes as well as take the final. That would be another reason to take that. Um, but we also encourage you, if you are signed up for that eight session package, to, to, uh, to participate in those to get more out of the course. Um, when it comes to PDHs though, the bottom line is if you attend the live session, you do not need to take and pass the quiz for PDHs. Uh, Again, all this information is found on your, if you log into your AISC account and go to your course resources. My thanks again to Dr. Frank for today's presentation, and we thank you all for joining us, and we'll be back here again next Thursday for session two. Thanks everyone, and have a great afternoon.